everyone we're just going to wait one minute more just to see if some stragglers are arrive. to welcome you to this February 2020 Civilian Oversight Commission meeting <clears throat> here at the Bienvenidos Family Resources Center. Uh, this is one of three meetings that we're going to be having during 2020 that is, is throughout, the, throughout the county. Uh, this is our, an official, our, this is our official monthly Civilian Oversight Commission meeting. Um, and as, as our tradition has been, we're going to um, sit in silence when I ring the bell uh, for a minute of quiet time meditation and just everyone can arrive here so we can be present for the community work that we're doing together. So if you please join me in silence. And now I'd like us to um, participate in the Pledge of Allegiance. I believe we, we have the flag. Commissioner Rubin, please. Thank you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America 
and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Another welcome to all of you to uh, this official meeting of the Civilian Oversight Commission. Um, I, I want to point out that, um, of course, we're not in our in, in our official place that we that we meet downtown, um, but this is an official meeting, and we are uh, under the Brown Act, and uh, we have certain protocols that we have to follow. Um, so this is not like a time uh, a town hall meeting where we may not uh, have a, a timer, and um, so we have a full agenda today. Um, and I'd like to remind everyone that we are guests here at uh, Bienvenidos, and so we want to uh, appreciate the uh, folks who uh, allowed us to use their space and also to be very respect respectful of this space. Um, we're going to have uh, public comment, as we always do, and the public comment will be two minutes on each topic, and I want to remind folks that you can speak to the agenda item that is that we're discussing and please stick to that agenda item and then at the end we're going to have public comment on any issue that you feel is relevant to uh, the sheriff's William Oversight Commission. I, I would like to know how many how many of you might uh, raise your hand if this is your first COC meeting that you've come to. Uh, well welcome. I'm glad you're here. Glad you're here. It shows us that if we take this show on the road, we'll we'll have a broader participation. <clears throat> so our first agenda item is the approval of the January 16, 20, 2020 minutes. Do we have a second. motion or the second? Everyone in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. <coughs> Passed. Men minutes are adopted. Um, Ms. Williams will call any speakers who have commentary on this topic about the minutes from January. We have three speakers. Our first speaker, Ronald Romdal, followed by Greg Allen, followed by Ronald Rodriguez Jr. Good morning. Good morning. Does anyone know the kind and quality of services offered by the LASB? Not in jails, but in communities like Compton, this one, Willowbrook, Rancho Dominguez. I'm a very results-oriented person, and I like to know what, if I'm making a $3 billion investment, I like to know what the return is going to be. So over the past several months, this commission has pointed to areas of what I would consider dysfunction within the organization. And is it unreasonable to believe that this function migrates out from its core? Is the development of quality service measures among your commission's strategic priorities? And if not, should they be? What gets measured gets done. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, um, good morning everybody. Good morning. Um, I'm, I'm asked everybody to, in the minutes, include the questions that some people had in public comment. My, my question that uh, I wanted to see written somewhere is the, does the sanctuary city policy make us safer or, or not? And uh, it's, it's quite clear that allowing undocumented criminals on our streets uh, makes it very unsafe for us. Uh, while you've been in your commission, I wanted to give you like a, a year end update. You've ushered in SB 54 at the uh, detriment of my public safety. Your oath to public safety and ushering in SB 54 are in conflict. They cannot be one or, it has to be one or the other. SB 54 is uh, a, death, a, a, a direct violation of your oath to public safety. I'll also say that to the police people who are here. I'm wearing blue to respect the police. This is still um, a month where we respect the sheriffs. 
I respect the sheriffs, I respect the, the men in, in uniform and their leaders. The top leaders I have a problem with their progressive philosophy of allowing undocumented on the, uh, in the, in, on our streets. I'd like them to change that. I'd like you all to take a look at uh, your commitment to my public safety. Your commitment to my public safety is in jeopardy. I do not trust your commitment when you've ushered in SB 54. Now you want to usher in uh, changing 49 felonies into uh, misdemeanors. Uh, Mr. Bonner had a couple of ones that he wanted off the list, and I'm wondering if that ever got off the list before uh, felonies he wanted to keep on there. Thank you. Please, uh, please respect my public safety by your actions. Marlon Rodriguez, Jr. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'd like to mimic what uh, Craig just said. I think it's important that uh, not only the state of California, but every state in the union prevent these illegals coming into our country. They need to come into this country legally, the right way. And when SB 54 was passed by California, the governor has committed a terrible thing for the safety of American citizens. We should be taking care of our safety first and especially the homeless in the streets. Instead of giving illegals some kind of medical and education, that's wrong. So just remember, America first. They should come first, the American citizens. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Um, now we're going to move to agenda item 2A. And, and I want to note that um, I really would like the public comment to stick to the agenda item that we are talking about. We're going to have a presentation on subpoena power, and then we invite public comment about that. Next, we'll be having a presentation from the uh, Los Angeles Sheriff's Department regarding their updated website. And I, I, I call for you to have your public comment be about that. And then obviously through the other updates. So at the end, you may talk to us about any topics that you feel are relevant to the Sheriff's Department, the work of the CLC in the community. So I just want to remind, especially since we have some new people joining us today. So thank you for that. <clears throat> so we're gonna to turn to uh, Agenda item 2A, discussing discussion regarding subpoena power. <clears throat> the Board of Supervisors recently adopted a motion to grant the COC subpoena power. In a week, we will have a new tool in our toolbox to utilize, when necessary, to help increase the level of transparency and accountability of the Sheriff's Department. While we are developing a process and a best practices strategy for using the power of the subpoena, one thing is clear. We must use it very judiciously and as a tool of last resort. We know that subpoena power will not get us everything we ask for. There are certain legal rules which will limit the amount of information the COC can receive. We likewise know that we cannot expect instant responses from the department. Some of the responses will take some time, some weeks, maybe even months. It is important that we all understand the issues involved with the issuance of a subpoena, and I'm gonna probably be continuing to ask all of us to manage our expectations about how fast these legal matters take or how slow these legal matters can take. <clears throat> but I think it's important that we begin to get an understanding of what the Board of Supervisors' action means for us. In today's presentation, we're working on a series, after today's presentation, we are working on a series of trainings for commissioners so that we can have an in-depth understanding of what subpoena power means and the best way within which to use it. Staff will begin scheduling those sessions uh, very soon. 
So here to give us a brief overview of the subpoena process is our county counsel, Lauren Black. Thank you for joining us, Ms. Black. And you have the microphone. Thank you. All right. Well, good morning. And as you stated, I'm Lauren Black. I'm an attorney with the Office of the County Counsel. Um, I appreciate the invitation to present on this topic. The purpose of this uh, presentation is to provide a broad overview of the COC's newly conferred subpoena power. Um, this power is so new indeed that it is not yet active. Um, the amendments to this ordinance become effective on February 28th. So this is going to be, as you stated, a very broad overview. And I know that many of you have lots of questions. Hold is up. someone trying, trying to dial into the presentation? Hey, hold on one second. I don't know why this is going on. Right. Oh, there we go. Okay. I've done plugging. I'm sorry. Okay. Was my time up? Is that? No. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, um, as I stated, this is going to be a broad overview. Um, you will have lots of questions. And um, my hope is that today I will give you a solid base um, as we move forward in this process. All right. Next slide. All right, so some of you may be more familiar with this than others, and so I wanted to take a moment to discuss what is an ordinance. Um, I thought it would be helpful to look at the legislative process of the state and the county side by side. On the right, you have the state legislature, um, the Senate and Assembly pass bills. Those become statutes, which are our codes and our, our state law. On the left, we have the County Board of Supervisors, which is the legislative body for the county. The supervisors pass ordinances which become the county code. So uh, when we refer to an ordinance, we're really talking about local laws that govern the county, the county here, the county of Los Angeles. Next slide. So the ordinance I'm here to discuss today um, begins with county code section 3.79020, um, which established the Civilian Oversight Commission. Um, and this ordinance was enacted on January 12, 2016. So the purpose of the commission, and I think this is important, so I am gonna read this, so I will not read all the slides. The purpose of the commission is to improve public transparency and accountability with respect to the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department by providing robust opportunities for community engagement, ongoing analysis and oversight of the department's policies, practices, procedures, and advice to the Board of Supervisors, Sheriff's Department, and the public. So this is why we are all here. Next slide. What is a subpoena? So here is the dictionary definition. There are lots of them, and this is actually the best of a bunch of really mediocre definitions. But what it is is a legal instrument to compel the production of records or testimony. So this is what uh, the new uh, amend the amendments give this commission. Next slide. Now what we have here is some of the new language in the amended COC ordinance that delegates subpoena power to this commission. And as I stated, this becomes law on February 28th, which, uh, a fun fact, is 30 days after the second reading of the Board of Supervisors. So that is how it works, pursuant to state law, how um, um, uh, ordinances are uh, amended. So here we have, oh, and you can't really see it. So. Uh, in blue, um, I'm just going to point out the commission, this is the new language, the commission in compliance with all laws and confidentiality protections may compel the production of information, documents, and testimony necessary to the commission's oversight function by directing the OIG to issue a subpoena on the commission's behalf when deemed necessary by action of the commission. All right, next slide, which is going to look a lot like this slide, but if you could see what I saw when I was creating this, the, uh, the highlighted language, I just wanted to point out that subpoena power, as um, the chair has pointed out in her introduction, does not allow unlimited access to information. Instead, it is a mechanism to obtain materials that are not otherwise protected by law. So what that means is that if something was legally protected before this ordinance amendment, it, is, it, it doesn't change character by the passage of this county ordinance, so it's still protected. And I have here highlighted the second part, the requirements and procedures for access to and review and redaction of confidential information received by the OIG are set forth in, 
his, uh, the, it's a subsection J of the county code, which is the ordinance that established and um, guides the inspector general. <coughs> All right, next. So this is the inspector general's ordinance, and this ordinance also was amended by recent board action and will become effective on February 28th. And what I've included here is a section that covers, um, that addresses subpoenas. And what you will see when you read it to yourself is that the OIG is responsible for issuing subpoenas that as directed by this commission, and he will, or she, whoever's sitting in the seat, will receive the response. So the OIG, pursuant to the staff of this ordinance, may share the response with the COC, provided it is consistent with all laws, including confidentiality laws. All right, next slide, please. And here we have um, my effort to give you a big picture sense of how this is all going to work. And at this point, what we have is an outline and we are going to be filling in the details and we are going to develop this process. Um, it's sort of a big B. It's going to be county council with the OIG, with the COC, and with the sheriff's department so that we can, we can fill, in, fill in a lot of the details. But at this point, I wanted to give you a broad overview of how this is going to work and some of the paths. So here's the first, the first step, which is actually highlighted, great. Um, in the process is that the COC is going to place an item on their me monthly meeting agenda. So in order to take action as a Brown Act body, you all need to meet in public. So it needs to appear on the agenda. So the agenda is created, as you all know, and many in the audience maybe don't know, um, is between the executive director and the chair of the commission. Next slide, all right. Once the item is before the commission and discussion is complete, including public comment, the COC will have the option to take official action. And here, that, is, that means a vote. So if a majority of the commissioners agree to issue a subpoena, you, the commission, may pass a motion to instruct the inspector general to take appropriate action. Next slide. So at this point, the inspector general will take the baton and the uh, OIG is responsible to issue the subpoena as directed by the commission. And the subpoena will be served on the responding party, which on my chart is the recipient um, for the purposes of making it fit in the box. So once the subpoena is served, there are three possible paths this process can take. And the first is compliance. Um, then that means that the requested items are produced to the OIG. And you see it stops. That would be the end of that path. The second path is the responding party does not comply with the subpoena. Now, the uh, way this, this process is governed by state law, and once a subpoena is served, there is a statutory period of 15 days in which to respond to a subpoena. The parties can agree to exp extend that time, and that is often the case. Um, all right, so in the event the responding party or recipient does not comply with the subpoena, which means they don't provide anything or they provide less than is requested, the OIG can uh, request relief from the Superior Court. And at that point, the Superior Court takes over and our process allows both parties to represent their positions to the court, and then the court will issue a ruling. I mean, I will say this box can go on a bit more because there is a right to appeal. Okay, another possible path is that the responding party or recipient may actually affirmatively ask the court to intervene, and that is called a motion to quash. Uh, quash uh, means, in legal terms, to nullify, void, or declare invalid. So similar to the second scenario, the parties will represent their positions to the judge and the judge will issue a ruling. All right, so this is what we have in terms of the process, the outline, it gives a, a, a general sense of what's happening here. We can go to the next slide. So I do wanna acknowledge that there is a ballot measure on the um, upcoming March 3rd 
um, ballot in the March 3rd election. And I do, I raise this issue, I include this language because it would amend the COC's ordinance and it does involve subpoena power. If you look at the actual language of, that the board passed, which I have to say, I'm not sure anyone does, but I encourage you to do it. It's very interesting on the county's website. You can actually click on the board of supervisors or I can provide it to you. Um, and maybe it can be a link on the, on the um, COC's website. But there is alternative language that would enact um, a, a B version of the, of, of the ordinance if Measure R passes. So you can read what it will look like if it passes. Now I say that because it is, it is a fact and um, I wanted to raise the issue, but I also wanted to tell you that the county is legally precluded from taking any position. So I don't wanna say anything that could be perceived as advocating for or against, so I'm gonna be very careful about that. Um, I just wanna acknowledge it and let you know that if you want to see what the version looks like that would be enacted if this passes, you are welcome to do so and look at the, the um, the uh, county's website. I also wanted to say, and this is just a plug in general for voting, that we do have an election upcoming. The language of Measure R and the um, official, I guess it's the official summary, is in your sample ballot. And everyone in LA County should have received this if you are registered to vote. If you aren't, go register. And it does include that language, and you can also find this on the Registrar Recorder's website, which is um, lavote.net. Um, so thank you. I appreciate this opportunity. I hope it was helpful, and I'm happy to take some questions. Uh, uh, first of all, um, uh, I assume that if the commission and when the commission uh, uses subpoena power to subpoena documents, first of all, I, I, I would expect that in many instances, if not most instances, there will be voluntary compliance. And won't have to I don't think your mic is on. Start over again. Okay. Is it on? Yeah. So uh, I'm just saying uh, I, I anticipate there would be uh, substantial voluntary voluntary compliance, and we wouldn't have to go through the procedures you've outlined for the Superior Court, going through the Superior Court to enforce our subpoena. But my question really goes to that. I, I would I would think uh, that most of our subpoenas will be for documents. Uh, use the sheriff's department documents, but conceivably documents of uh, other parties. Uh, but there might be occasions where we want to subpoena a witness to appear and testify before uh, this body at a hearing. And if we're going to do that, and we may well decide to do that, we would, uh, uh, I believe, we would need the authority to be able to swear witnesses. And I'm just wondering, is that authority, do we currently have that authority? Uh, Will the ordinance give us that authority? Will Measure R give us that authority? Or will we be not able to swear witnesses that we subpoena? You know, I actually do not bring the language but of the ordinance up with me. Um, but the, the the power of subpoena is included in the ordinance and it is, it's not limited. <laughs> okay, so the power, the power of the subpoena, where would we, I mean, is it? It, it is in the ordinance that uh, that will be actually I have that, it in the that, that may be adopted by the board. The board obviously has to make the final decision here on the second reading. Right. But it's actually in. Okay, I just didn't see it. So. So actually, looking back, it's on slide seven. It's the um, or that's the OIDs, but it's um, it does include uh, records, documents. Uh, let's see, testimony, issuing subpoenas for records, documents, information, or testimony. So, inferably, we, uh, the chair would have the ability to swear a witness if we subpoena a witness to appear before this. So, actually, the ordinance allows the inspector general to administer the oath. I think there's, there's state law that under appropriate circumstances permits it, and I believe, although I too do not have the language in front of me, that, that the, the ordinance which the board has done the second meeting on, which goes live in a few days, includes a specific provision authorizing the swearing of oaths, oaths by the OIG exactly. in in the service of those subpoenas. So I think exactly what you're describing, we will have the legal ability to do. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Lauren, who represents this commission in uh, court if the sheriff 
moves to quash our subpoena or ignores the subpoena, I assume we have to go to court, who will represent the commission? So at this point, I'll, what I will say is the commission will be represented. I mean, but I, I really, I, the details are being worked out. And so I don't wanna, I, I think it's not productive to go down that line right now. I, I, but I, I will say that all the parties will be represented. Mr. Kennedy and members of the commission, I, I just wanted to point out, uh, we're still in the early stages of this. We're gonna plan a number of training sessions for the county council to answer, I think, many of the questions. I don't want to put uh, council in the position of providing legal advice in a public forum, which may or may not be confidential to the commission, uh, but I think we're gonna be lots of questions at that point. Right, and, that, no, and I, I, right, I think it's a fair question, and so I don't, I don't mean to shut you down, uh, Mr. Kennedy, but I do want to say that that there, if there is a complicated dynamic, if there's a complicated dynamic, if if a subpoena is served on a county entity, um, and what I can assure you is that there will be there will be adequate representation. I mean, I'd love to say that I'm going to represent you. Um, <laughs> and we know but, that. But at that, at this point, I will ensure that you that the commission is. I can I can assure that the commission will be represented. Yeah. Otherwise, why would you have this? Why would we have this if we're not represented? Absolutely. Are you are you are you asking for a specific who in county council would no, be the who our lawyer like, would, would be? Will be independent council? Will it be county council? Will county council also be representing the sheriffs? I think it's a fair it's, question. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, not, I'm not disagreeing with you. I think it is a fair question. Oh, it is fair. Yeah. It's totally and, fair. And, and I that's why I you know I'm acknowledging that we are developing the process right now. Any other questions? Okay. All right. Well, we look forward to the uh, design of the process and learning more about how we can use this tool, which is uh, obviously this is subpoena power is um, a tool that's across the country with other civilian oversight commissions. Um, people want to have as many tools in the toolbox as they can and want to use it judiciously. So if you need a key to open a door in a lock, you want to use the best key, the right key. You don't necessarily want to take a hammer to the lock and you know and break through. So that's those are the some of the things that we'll be learning. How you know what are our possibilities? How do we use this tool? So I think we're all looking forward to to learning how this tool can be used, can be useful and helpful to the work of uh, oversight. So thank you very much. Thank you. So now we are going to turn to public comment. We have seven speakers. First speaker, Isaac Asbury, followed by Dr. Alan Zuckerman, followed by Greg Allen. Good morning. Good morning. I'll be quick. I'm more concerned about uh, officer-involved shootings and the uh, subpoena power you will have uh, in 2019, we lost uh, 24 people killed by the Sheriff Department. I could read their names, but uh, I'll bypass that. But if we give you the names, will you be able to also interview the officer? That's one of my questions. Um, second, I, I don't see why the name of the officer for 2019 would not be provided, it has not been provided the whole year. So I don't know what's, what's really happening. So if you can look into that, I appreciate that. That's all I have. Okay. Thank you. Dr. Allen Zuckerman, followed by Greg Allen, followed by Jacqueline Ventures. Good morning. Um, I may take a roundabout way, but this is about subpoena power. Uh, I spent 10 years at the Los Angeles County, as a Los Angeles County Deputy Sheriff working for both Peter J. Pitches and Sherman Block. During the years under these leaders, there was no significant acrimony between the Board of Supervisors nor the major local publication, the Los Angeles Times. 
Although the relationship between the board, the Times, and the new sheriff, uh, Jim McDonald, was polite and no significant criticism was directed his way, there were significant problems within the agency and uh, current Sheriff Alex Villanueva enumerated those problems. Under McDonald's watch, there were budget deficits, lack of meritocracy for advancement, low morale, rising crime, escalation of jail violence, including assaults on sheriff's personnel, inability to, pre uh, to recruit new candidates, and that created inadequate staffing, resulting in mandated overtime, a ballooning budget, little training, and overly punitive discipline system that lacked, was lacking in due process. Sheriff McDonald unilaterally changed the disciplinary procedures by violating the MOU. The County Employees Relations Commission cited <coughs> McDonald's inappropriate disciplinary policy as it violated deputies' due process. Why was there no criticism of then Sheriff McDonald's unilateral in the federal government to divulge the names of undocumented inmates? Sheriff Villanueva eliminated ICE from the county jails. Villanueva inherited all of the department's problems and eradicated them excuse, by the first- Excuse me, sir, but your, your, time, your time is up. It's there are uh, too many testimonies. Are you going to cut me halfway off through my re, uh, my? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to have to because we have to we have to hold to the way other people who need to give testimony. You know, it's you, only going to take yeah, another. You know what you like? Look, what I would suggest to the public: you can come back and finish at the at the end with the public testimony. Why can't you, you just back. give me another minute that it would take to read? I, please, we're going to have to just stick to the time. Thank you so I much. I think that's very rude. Please, I'm not trying to be rude, but please you come are, back. Though. Greg Allen, followed by Jacqueline Venters, followed by Adam Saragosa. Good morning again. Um, <clears throat> I'm concerned that our sheriff is uh, not cooperating with his, uh, his commitment to my public safety. Um, as far as the subpoena power goes, uh, with all of you having that power, I'm kind of concerned. You, you've only been around three years, and now all of a sudden you're going to get subpoena power. What concerns me most is the safety of the employee of the sheriff, the actual man on the street who's doing the sheriff's job. I, don't, I think that there's a lot of internal ways that these gentlemen who might be uh, under your supervision of, of oversight to be taken care of, disciplinary, disciplined through the ranks, the way they do it already. If you need something, uh, as far as the subpoena goes, I don't see the reason for it. If there's any court battles, the court battles get done. People get sued and it's handled in court. Why do you guys need subpoena power? What are you trying to find out? I'm not happy with a lot of your accomplishments here. You know, ushering in SB 54, changing laws, you know, what is the subpoena power going to do in the future? Anyway, um, I uh, only want my sheriff to be protected. If the subpoena power hurts the sheriffs, I don't want it. If it helps, if it, if it helps you find corruption in the sheriff's department, I'm all for that. I, I do feel that there might be areas of our sheriffs that are tainted. And I'm only saying that because I've been coming here long enough to notice. And uh, as far as the uh, LA Board of Supervisors go, why don't the 27 people that uh, Alex Villanueva rehired, why don't we just stop their pay? That's what they did with Mr. Montoya. That's what they can do with all these other sheriffs. Thank you. Jacqueline Venters, followed by Adam Saragosa, followed by Mia Moreno. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm here today because I believe in what's right, and you know what's right, we must continue to fight. I'm asking and begging you, Mr. Williams, to um, request when we start this process off with the subpoena power that we go back to the deputies that was listed in the um, in the lawsuit with the Supreme Court. That was because of KPC, KPCC Radio, um, Annie Gilbertson for a year and a half to uh, request files for Deputy Gonzalo Zuzer, 
who wrongfully shot my son five times in the back. And it was so bad, they, they still haven't released him today. Um, Mr. Huntsman, your office submitted an a investigation last year and they have never responded, never ever as of today. Ms. Zuber resubmitted this um, investigation. The Sheriff Department still has not responded. This was in 2011. It's all kind of news articles regarding this case um, and the shooting. And this, all this subpoena stuff, it came from this case. And I think that we need some help. If we're gonna have some transparency in this um, wrongful acts of the Sheriff Department, we need to start where it started at. This deputy right here, you told me last time, Mr. Husband, that I, when I was here, that um, you didn't believe that this deputy shot four people in seven months. It's in the LA Times article. I'm getting ready to give this package over to this young lady right here, and I'm asking Please you guys do. to take a look at some of this stuff in here. Will do, thank you so much. Adam Zaragoza, followed by Mia Moreno, followed by Julie Diaz Martinez. Good morning, my name is Adam Saragosa. I work intervention, tree diversion with um, Soledad Enrichment Action, um, funded through District 1. And I'm in agreement with the, the subpoena power because I believe transparency is a big thing. Diversion in East LA, we don't have it because there's no, there's no transparency, there's no collaboration with sheriffs. Not just that, I believe it's a big thing for these mothers that lost through sheriffs that we get phone calls that they don't know what to do at times because who do they call when they feel they're being gang stalked or they feel they're being harassed that they don't want to give addresses because they don't want to find out where they live. So things like that, transparency I believe is key. Accountability. Us, me when I was in the lifestyle, I was always held accountable to the point I lost the majority of my youth over it. And now, being, now that I'm able to be a youth advocate, I want to be that voice and be that transparency that the youth need. Because if they, don't, if they have no trust, then we'll just continue to add to the trauma that, that society is already building on them. First thing we learn in the neighborhood is not to trust, not to feel, not to speak. How are we supposed to teach our youth to, to trust, to feel, and speak when they don't have no guidance of where it starts? So I'm just here to say I'm in agreement, and uh, I believe transparency is key. Thank you. Thank you. Mia Moreno, followed by Julie Diaz-Martinez. Hello, Mia Moreno with Soledad Enrichment Action. And uh, same as Adam and the woman that went before him, I came in agreement, because I believe this is long awaited. I believe this is a blessing to those that are going through um, a lot of sheriff involved shootings that um, unfortunately we have to respond to this year. And um, yeah, I'm just here in agreement with it. And to really, I know their um, mom said that it was only three years, you guys are only three years here, but you guys really are and have been hearing out the people and the, and the community that is here voicing what you're really going through. And um, I wanna thank you all for that. And yeah, this is, I'm just here in support of it. Thank you. She was our final speaker. Julia Martinez, sorry. Hi, I'm here in support of Measure R, but I'd also like to make you aware of a, an incident with Sheriff Ian Wave on last week. There was a call in on the local radio station KPCC in which residents and community members could call in. He called in and claimed, declared his name, and then claimed that he was a private citizen and speaking outside of his office. I encourage you to look up the transcripts of that because he utilized and he, he commandeered the time which was, should have been meant for citizens and residents to call and weigh in on their um, on what they thought Measure R would do or not do for the community. He utilized his time to blast the COC to disparage the County Board of Supervisors. He also claimed that he would spend money, taxpayer dollars, on fighting Measure R. He said it was a waste of taxpayers' money, so I'm paraphrasing it, 
But he said he will not cooperate, he will fight it, it's going to spend, waste millions of county do dollars, tie up millions of money, it, and it would in interfere with the sheriff's ability to, to police the communities. I think it's extremely important for public comment to have been allowed on this radio station, and yet Sheriff Villanueva commented the entire time and spoke about himself. He, was, he spoke very angrily. I, I really encourage you to look up the transcripts of that particular radio call. Be, because yet again, he's showing the community why we cannot trust him. He is going to be fighting Measure R, which may or may not be a surprise to you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Now we're going to move to agenda item 2B, which is a presentation by the Sheriff's Department on the new website. So we're going to call Mr. Satterfield to um, and I think Captain George Valdez is also here or not? No. no okay, so we have uh, Lieutenant John Saddle, Satterfield from the Sheriff's Information Bureau. Thank you for being here. It's my pleasure. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So to talk about where the website was and where it's at now, I'll give you a little bit of background. The, the problem that existed with LASD's website was that the, uh, the information wasn't easily accessible. There wasn't a lot of information placed on the website and there were site navigation problems, brand transparency problems. Uh, it was not mobile device friendly for tablets and cellular phones, uh, smartphones. Uh, there were multiple platforms that were kind of piecemealed together and uh, it, it just wasn't 21st century. So uh, in order to solve that problem, uh, we had to address some of the challenges, which were the different programming languages, uh, no information architecture practices, uh, poor content management system, uh, expansion had significant cost constraints attached to it. There were poor site navigation experiences by the community users. Uh, there was no what's called SSL certificate. It's a uh, secure socket for <coughs> privacy, so your information is protected. So those were some of the challenges. Uh, the solutions were that we produce a sort of service-oriented website, one host domain instead of multiple domains, uh, cohesive main navigation, acquired an SSL certificate so it could be a trusted site, better search ranking results uh, for the analytics, uh, cleaned up pages that went to nowhere or went to old outdated material, and uh, just brought it up to the standard that it should be at so that uh, the community can access what they're looking for and uh, not have a tough time doing it. So uh, the structure was redesigned. So when we redesigned the structure, yes. I don't think that's any better. No, no, it's better. I think it's worse. <laughs> 
redesign the structure, uh, it was a complete redesign so that the user would have uh, a very good experience. As you can see on the graphics, it, it's extremely easy to find what you're looking for. One of the uh, one of the features that was added was transparency data, and uh, that's where all of the information that I, I would believe community members and uh, this commission would be interested in. And uh, it's still <coughs> there's a charm. Testing. Hey. 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 21st century technology right yeah. there. <laughs> Maybe you need us to redesign your microphones. <laughs> <laughs> so on the structure it, it's very easy to use uh, the, the contents displayed as either a story blog format a site page format or a subsite format the transparency data is where we're really focusing on right now and uh, it, it's not happening overnight, but we are trying to get it done as quickly as we can with, uh, within the, uh, the high level of accuracy that uh, the community deserves. Uh, just, just this week, we were able to add to the transparency data and uh, uh, open uh, and make live the web pages for uh, deputy and ball shootings. And uh, at the end of this presentation, uh, I'm going to try to access that and show you in real time the website and how to access the data that uh, I, I heard some public comments already today about. Navigation, uh, as I've already alluded to, we, we've simplified it to the point where uh, users should be able to find what they're looking for without frustration or without uh, too much effort being placed into it. And uh, we have a main navigation uh, header and uh, we have a quick bar link footer that's on every page. So no matter what page you're on, you're always going to see that, and you can go back to where you want to be. Uh, there's an email contact form. So if, if you have a question and uh, you can't find that information, you can type uh, through the email contact form, and that will go to a 24-7 man uh, entry uh, at uh, the Sheriff's Information Bureau they will get that information and can start working on it. In addition, we have uh, placed what we call the LASD chatbot on there. And it's uh, a database, uh, kind of like a, a, a mini search engine uh, for just LASD.org. You type in a keyword of what it is you're trying to find or look for or a name and the web bot, uh, the LAC chat bot will, will pull up suggestions uh, to really simplify your experience and uh, help you find the data that you're looking for quickly. And uh, the frequently asked questions content, uh, we monitor the analytics of what is being searched the most and then we add to in a constant state of update and revision are frequently asked questions to try to assist uh, the user. On content, uh, right now our biggest push is towards transparency data because uh, the sheriff uh, ran on a platform of transparency and he is going to deliver and uh, 
that's what we're working on uh, diligently right now to try to get it right as quickly as we can for the community. Uh, we also have public information, contact information, uh, resources that are available. And uh, again, we're trying to do the best we can <coughs> and get it right and do it in as timely a manner as we can. So uh, with that, is there a way I can get someone to click on? Can you click on the actual LES? Oh, you've already got it pulled up, good. So, uh, oh, 21st century technology. So this, this is LESD.org, right to the homepage. And from here, you can, if you want to know something about a patrol station, if you want to know something on the newsroom, inmate information, which is uh, one of our top five hits uh, are always in inmate information, trying to help family members learn as much as they can about their loved ones, family members, friends, for uh, visitation purposes, for how to assist them with uh, uh, purchasing items within the facilities, uh, recruitment, careers, and then, uh, of course, transparency data. I'll click on transparency data. And this is our transparency data webpage. And uh, again, it, it's still under construction. We're still in a, a, a state of adding to it and making it what, what the true vision is. We're not done yet, but we're, we're trying to get as much as we can in there. Uh, here's uh, newly added deputy involved shootings. And this is available to anyone that has internet right now in lifetime. Uh, we placed a, uh, uh, a little preamble that explains the process. And then we've got a graphic if, uh, if someone wants to see how the uh, investigation is run when there's a deputy involved shooting and the process. And then uh, the, uh, uh, all the information for the deputy involved shootings. We, we, is that uh, live now? This is live right now. In 2020, can we look at a date of incident? Well, there, there have been no deputy involved shootings in 2020. Oh, this is 2020. So it's not going to go backwards? Like yeah, absolutely now. Previous years. Great, okay. Ever okay. since uh, uh, Sheriff Villanueva was uh, sworn in is where we're going back to. So here are the 2019 shootings. And as I said, we're still solving all these issues. Ultimately, we're going to put in the summaries. Uh, we, we have uh, Homicide Bureau is right now, as we speak, working on summaries for each one of these incidents so that that can be placed online for community members to read. Uh, we want to place the original report online for that shooting uh, when, when we can, the coroner's report and any video attached to it. And that's what these expansion boxes are. And uh, when, this, when this is done, anything that you want to know as a citizen about these incidents, it'll be right there at your fingertips. This is what the sheriff said he wanted, and this is what we're providing to the community. So with that, I'll ask is, are there any questions I can answer? I have a question on the, the, the summaries that you're going to develop. Yes. Um, um, you know, we've done a lot of work with uh, bringing together, uh, of, of, you know, growing the uh, MET teams and the relationship between the Department of Mental Health and the Sheriff's Department. And that has had some success in reducing um, the uh, injury and uh, death of the particular people with some mental issues. So it's going in the right direction. We also have, uh, are in process, but in making, in making inroads on the development of the family assistance program. 
which is a trauma-informed program, and the MET program, obviously, is a trauma-informed program. So my question for this type of public uh, sharing of information, transparency, as you say, which we all want, but at the same time, I'm, uh, I'm interested and curious and hopeful that those summaries are gonna also be presented with a trauma-informed lens because communities will be reading them, family members will be reading about their family members. Um, so um, so that's, that's something that just became very, um, we all want transparency, but we also need sensitivity, compassion, empathy, um, appropriate communication, accurate information. Um, and I'm also mindful of one of the things that families have come to us and to the Sheriff's Department about is they don't want to be the last one to know. So that we don't want families to be reading information on a public forum on a computer, which now is ultra 21st and people can just read it on their mobile phone so everybody can know about it. And the families have not been adequately informed, communicated with, and also prepared to know that this is what's gonna be on the computer, on everybody's computer. So that's my um, big concern. And I'm not saying you're not already thinking about that, because I know that you're thinking about it in other departments. So with how, are you thinking about it? Uh, can you reassure us that you are and that we'll know more about how those things are gonna be handled? Absolutely, and, and to answer your question directly, yes. We, we have had uh, several meetings with uh, the uh, entities involved in the creation of these summaries, and uh, empathy and tact and, and a, a, a real human-centered focus and lens uh, is definitely already part of that process. Uh, I will take uh, your uh, concerns back to the department uh, in regards to notification of family members before we post it online. And uh, we'll follow up uh, with the commission on that. Uh, does that answer your question? Yes, yeah, that's helpful. And, and also, as I, as I mentioned, you know, <clears throat> there's been more cross-departmental um, uh, programming and communication, right, with, with the Sheriff, the Department of Public Health, Department of Mental Health, CARD are all together working, just particularly on that. So we're having right now a, an example of a, of a best practice um, on uh, the community to be able to trust that all the departments that can come into play and be helpful are talking to each other. And so I guess my next suggestion would be to definitely utilize the relationships that you are building with the Department of Mental Health in particular, and also the Department of Public Health. Um, and so their expertise, that social worker, I know everybody wants to say, you know, cops can't be social workers. Well, I think in this transformational period we, we're in, we're also looking at how can the social workers help law enforcement, how can law enforcement protect the social workers and how can there be an interface and so that there's more of a blurring of how communities are treated um, so that they're treated with the highest level of esteem and respect. So I, I'm hoping that we'll see some interdepartmental uh, um, communication and see good results in terms of how things are worded, how things are phrased and also obviously making sure that families know and see what's going to be talked about before the public does. So thank you for uh, taking this seriously. Um, first off, I'd like to uh, congratulate the department for um, your strides in making the website user-friendly. And I think that's immensely helpful for everybody. Um, I, um, you made mention of the fact that there were, you know, you had conversations with, you used the term entities involved. And um, related to that, I, I wonder what entities you've had conversations with because 
I would have hoped and do hope that you have had conversations with community members and community organizations in terms of what it is they would like to see in a website. Now, it obviously doesn't mean that you, know, you can um, make good on every request, but when we talk about transparency, it's really important to involve the community to find out what it is the community wants and needs. So I guess it's a two-fold question. What are the entities and what have you done to engage the community? I'll, I'll take the second question first. Uh, we did engage the community through uh, the analytics that were pulled from what the community is interested in on the old website. Uh, we had all of the what, what's referred to as hits on certain aspects of the older website. We knew what the community wanted based on what it was that they were searching and finding. I honestly can't tell you what all stakeholders within the community that we've interacted with. Uh, I can tell you that over the last year, the, uh, the team that is involved in this has done uh, the, the absolute best product that we feel can assist the community. Uh, a lot of the things that we presented in the website, the community didn't even maybe be, wasn't possibly even aware of could be done. Uh, but in meetings such as this forum, the communities made it clear some of the things that they would like. So that was taken into consideration. And then uh, specifically on the summaries again, that, that's what I was actually referring to when I said entities, uh, was uh, on the summaries. And uh, the, the, those were all internal uh, at this point. Uh, we haven't involved outside of the department on how to formulate our uh, summaries for the uh, uh, deputy involved shootings. Because until we have a product that we are, are okay with other people seeing, we're not gonna incorporate outside stakeholders uh, until we've got something good enough to show them. That's but it is sure. the intent to bring in members of the community or community groups to work with us uh, in, in the finalization of what our uh, final product should look like. Uh, but it, we're, we're not at that phase yet. Thank you. First of all, uh, of course, the, this Oversight Commission has been uh, advocating greater transparency on the part of the Sheriff's Department, really from our inception, uh, well before uh, Sheriff Villanueva was uh, elected and became Sheriff. But I just want to say uh, for myself in any event that I, I commend the Sheriff. I applaud the Sheriff's positive steps toward achieving greater transparency. Um, my question would be, um, I realize that uh, some of this, this is a work in progress, the redesign website. Um, but, and I don't want to put you too much on the spot here, but you said it's not done and it clearly isn't done yet, but when will it be done? When will, will it be substantially done? What's your best estimate on that? You said you didn't want to put me on the spot. <laughs> well, I, I always start with, that means I'm putting you on the spot. <laughs> I, I'll, I'll answer it in this manner. It'll be done as absolutely quickly as we can do it, getting it right. Uh, so don't ask me. Uh, I'm, I'm, <laughs> will it be done this year? No. I absolutely foresee it be done this year, yes. Okay. I'll, I'll say it'll be done in 2020. Yeah, exactly. there, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of moving parts to this. Yeah. And uh, we, we don't have increased funding for, for this project either. Uh, so we're, we're trying to make it work with the personnel. We haven't added any additional personnel. We haven't uh, uh, purchased any additional hardware, software. We're, we're trying to do this as best we can within our budgetary constraints. 
And uh, I, I mean, personally, I think we're doing a phenomenal job with, with speed and accuracy and bringing it in within our budget. But uh, I, I can foresee, yes, 2020 will definitely. Uh, I hope to see the transparent, we're, we're really focusing on the transparency side, but there's also other aspects of the department that still haven't been transferred over onto the new site. Uh, custody division is still on the old website and uh, we, we have uh, not completely rebuilt it. Uh, we anticipate doing that within the next uh, few months. Uh, we have a schedule as to how we're bringing all the other uh, units into the uh, LASD.org new website, but it, it takes time. And then in addition to that, the personnel that we have working on this, they, they have other duties also. So when Los Angeles County is tasked with uh, something that was unexpected or the Sheriff's Department is tasked with something unexpected, then that, that puts the pause button on projects like this. But uh, it, it is an absolute, to use a police term, code three uh, project, and we're, we're working on it as, as best that we can, but still to provide the most accurate product that we can. Would you provide to us, uh, I, I'm, I'm impressed by the way that you've done this within the existing budget, because this is a substantial expansion of what you've been doing for the, uh, for the website, so. Perhaps could you perhaps give us uh, what additional budget would be helpful, let's say, to bring this in uh, at an even rapid, more rapid speed than at the end of the year, let's say within the next four or five months, what additional supplemental budget would you need to accomplish that? Absolutely. We're, we're starting those talks now. Uh, the, the sheriff made it very clear that, that, that this is not something that we're going to allow to be held off by budgetary constraints, we're gonna get this done right now as best as we can. But there is additional budgetary, uh, as you said, uh, that we're gonna need to calculate and we're starting to do that now uh, while still getting the job done. Thank you. And, and we will, we'll report back to that. Two things come up for me and I'm not a, I'm not a techie, but I know a bit around uh, having to upgrade or create a new website and I know how uh, challenging it is and you have to build it and then you have to populate it with the content. Um, so uh, my question is, is it, since transparency, uh, since the sheriff is clearly wanting to rebrand uh, the website but with transparency, Maybe, maybe transparency is going to be part of his brand. And it's part of our brand with the COC. That's why we were created to ensure transparency about many, many things. So we can have that in common, you know, commonality there. So I'm interested in whether or not, since we have asked to be previewed uh, policies, policy changes, new policies. Is it possible for us to see some of the beta testing as it's developed? You know, as you, uh, you know, before it's, you know, some of the things that you're working on, before it's completely done, um, is it possibly that, that, that this commission could be invited to have some preview so that we know some of the direction uh, that it's going in? Um, technology that you're trying to do seems really great. In fact, it can be out in the mobile, et cetera. Uh, it's certainly necessary now. Um, so that's a question. And do you think that that's possible? Because one of the things that we have, we've, we've asked to be invited in as things develop in the Sheriff's Department. And we're going to continue asking, right? And so I'm wondering on this topic, on this project, um, could that be put, uh, you know, come into consideration? so that we can, as it's developing further, that we can see a little bit more and get some previews. Uh, absolutely, I'll take your, uh, your request back to the department and uh, we'll follow up. Uh, the one comment I would make just as a project manager would be the more people that you include in the, the, the beta side of it, the more time you add. 
you, you start adding time to things. And uh, uh, you start trying to get schedules together and well, can you do this on next week? And right now, this project moves so fast because we work on it when we can and, uh, and then get it out. Uh, in, uh, in the words of George Patton, a, uh, an okay plan executed right now is better than a perfect plan executed next week or tomorrow. Or never. <laughs> or never. <laughs> so uh, that, that was the theory behind this is we're not going to wait for this thing to be perfect. We're going to get it out there, let the community start using it, and, and just keep adding to it instead of waiting a year and then putting it on. But my, uh, I'll, I'll definitely take okay, back my, your and request. My other question is with this bot thing where people can ask questions, make comments. Well, I mean, it, and how is that going to be managed, monitored, responded to? Could you talk a little bit more about that? Absolutely. The, the bot is a search engine. It, it's right. no different than Google, uh, except it's our private website little search engine. You type in a keyword or name or something that you want to look for, because there, there's a lot of information on here, information and data. Uh, it, it can be hard for someone to find something. Uh, we've made it as simple as we can, but sometimes people just may, may not find what they're looking for. You type that keyword in there, and it'll come back with a return, just like when you use Google. And uh, you click on those different returns until you find what you're looking okay, for. So it's not a two-way community. It's not no. like a social media thing. It's the, back and forth that people are, somebody's watching and, and commenting and then somebody else is commenting back. It's not that. The bot is not, no. But the email. But the email is. The email goes to a real live human being 24-7 that is staffed around the clock at the Sheriff's Information Bureau. And that will be for custody also? That, that's for anyone in the community. Because that, I mean, custody is one of the areas where um, people uh, have, have come to us and before us looking for information that they haven't been able to get. And they come in, you know, and they come and complain actually, and they ask us for help, right? Um, and so that, this now is gonna open a door for people to speak directly to someone at the Sheriff's Department about a family member or a loved one who's in custody and they're trying to get them some, they want to, have they, they want to make sure they're getting their prescriptions, their medicines, all those kinds of things. That will go on li um, live time. Well, I, I believe that already exists. I, I would have to actually research that uh, on, on the custody side. I can't speak to that. Uh, but it, I, I, it's my belief that that's already in place. If there are problems, I can tell you that one, one of the, uh, the core principles of the new website is that we're going to simplify it and put so much information on and make it so easy to use that you're probably not going to have a lot of questions because it's all there. It's all a couple clicks away and, and you won't need to make a phone call, but in the event that you do. Well, you won't need to make a phone call if you're looking for a specific kind of information. That is understood. But if you are concerned about how someone is being treated or about an incident that's being reported. This is not the venue then. The, the, the standard calling the watch commander at a patrol station or a custody facility would be the way that, that, as we've always had in place to handle that problem. If someone's being mistreated, that, that's not a, a website issue. That's a call the watch commander, file a complaint issue. So if someone who uses, does an email and says, you know, I want to, um, uh, I'm concerned about my brother who is uh, detained and he's telling me he's not getting his medications. That would immediately be handled. How, in, how would that happen? Real time. Real time. You, you would go onto the website, you would fill out the email, you would hit send. It would go to Sheriff's Information Bureau 24-7, uh, someone staffing it. They would, when they review the emails, uh, see that, open it up, either make a phone call, redirect. Uh, they're going to contact the appropriate authority that's supposed to have the handle on that, uh, that, that complaint, that issue. And, uh, so and those wheels person, would be put in If on. I'm that person that emailed that concern, someone who's going to get back to me via email and say, we, you know, we're, we're following up, 
da da da, we're doing this, or could you please contact X, Y, and Z? Is there is that kind is it that kind of interaction? That that's the way that the system is supposed to work. Okay. Yes. Now, there are human error. There are uh, administrative problems at times. Uh, I can't tell you that it's going to be infallible because human beings are involved. But I can tell you that the, the, that the system that's been developed, yes, that's how it's supposed to work. Okay, well, I, 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 yeah, well, that's going to be an interesting part because I know the community is going to be very interested to see how that works because that's where they're going to go. Mm -hmm. You know, because they're not getting help over here and they made too many phone calls over here and they have that option, they're going to go there. And so, I'm hoping that, um, and again, this is something I'm hoping that we'll be able to get to see how you develop it. And if we can uh, lend any support uh, to make sure that it does work. You know, not, nothing works perfectly, but it works that we continue to improve this, this um, communication and connection between community and the services of, this, of the Sheriff's Department. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, just real quickly, I believe it. Commissioner Giggins did raise it, and I just want to reemphasize the extreme importance on these summaries that someone with an extremely sensitive eye looks at these, and that the department goes way out of its way to make sure that family members, close family members, are basically advised what's going to be going on that website before it goes on. Because that could just be a real, real traumatic situation for some of these folks. I, we all recognize that there's a whole lot of family members you can't contact, all the extended family all over the United States. We get that. But I hope that the, uh, the contact will be made in maybe a little time given, i.e., we didn't contact them at 3 o'clock and at 4 o'clock it went on the website. You give the family members once you have notified them, at least they'll have a little time to get a hold of whatever family members need to know recognizing it and yeah, to kind of have a perfect situation but we, I just want to really reemphasize how important that is uh, you know, we work really hard on the family assistance program you know, put in a lot of you know work with, with mental health and coroner and others to you know provide these uh, uh, these um, resources to folks that they need them uh, so I just want to make sure that the department really fully appreciates how sensitive we are that absolutely any other questions? Mr. Huntsman? Sure. Can you tell me how many people are can you tell me how many people are employed by the Sheriff's Information Bureau? Approximately twenty-five. And in eight thirty-two point seven of the penal code, there's a requirement that if the department withholds information about shootings, um, any information at all, don't provide all the police reports, the coroner's reports. They can withhold it up to 60 days if they provide a written explanation. But they provide a written explanation for why. And as the time goes out farther, that the standards for that explanation become much greater, including actually, I think it's a little bit farther out, maybe 60 days, uh, having clear and convincing evidence that it will interfere with a criminal prosecution to put that information out. And at 18 months, um, uh, there's an elaborate process that involves the court to be able to withhold information. Can you tell me how many people in the Sheriff's Information Bureau are working on creating those documents? No, I can't. Are you aware of any? Creating the summaries? Anybody in the Sheriff's, not the summaries of what happened, but the compliance with 832.7's uh, requirement that if you don't put information out, you explain why it is you're not doing it. Is anybody in Sheriff's Information Bureau working on that? I believe that is actually with a different bureau. And Audit what bureau would that be? I believe. I'm sorry? Uh, I believe, I could be wrong, I believe it's Audit Accountability Bureau. So the sheriff has repurposed Audit and Accountability Bureau to comply with Public Records Act requests. Do you think they're also working on compliance with 832.7 on shooting? Well, you're asking me for opinions that I'm not here to present and I have no authority to speak on. So you're putting me in a very bad position right now. You don't have to answer, that's fine. Okay. Um, you showed us some placeholders regarding the shootings, but if you click on any of those things you showed us for the shootings of last year, no information comes up, does it? At, at this okay. point, the only thing that's on the website is what you saw. We have not made it to actually propagating 
those four columns yet. And there's not there's nothing behind it. There was no 2018 or any of the any other shootings. It's just 2019. Correct. Okay. And as far as you know, the document I talked about, where the sheriff's department explains why information hasn't been put out because it would interfere with an investigation. Have you ever seen any one of those documents for any shooting ever? That's not my bureau. <coughs> I, but, you, but you haven't seen it. I'm not aware of what you're talking about. That's not in my normal job. Okay. I'm, I'm not aware of it happening either, but I just wanted to be sure that you weren't aware of it. Thank you. Uh, just one short one. Thank you so much uh, for this presentation. Um, what? So information is it, is it about the, the twenty five people who work in the Department of the Information? Is, is it is it this? It's it's computers. No. This. It, this what, what, what what is the what is the your department do? Well, it, the Sheriff's Information Bureau. Yeah, Information Bureau. The the main job duty is public information officer. Okay. So, uh, rolling out to the scene of something and liaisoning with the media in order to provide information. That's one of the primary job duties of Sheriff's Information Bureau. Now, we also have uh, a operations center that uh, is 24-7 operation that helps the, uh, the patrol stations and uh, helps manage tactical incidents for the department. We have a film and media uh, production crew that puts together videos, that uh, puts on press conferences, that answers the phones uh, and answers uh, reporters' questions. Um, there is a graphics art department, and uh, also now we do the website. So there, there's a lot of hats that are being taken on and off, a lot of job duties, and we just try to do the best we can for the community with the personnel that we have. There's a lot of cross-training that goes on, and uh, uh, I, I think they do a phenomenal job, and I'm proud of all the people that work there. Well, thank you so much. We look forward to hearing more as you progress um, and hearing um, some of your feedback from when you bring the questions that we've had. And also, uh, again, uh, any way that we can be collaborative and, uh, and lend our, uh, our um, well, lend our role in transparency to be, to be helpful. So thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you. Have a good day. So now we're going to turn to public comment on this item of the new website. Our first speakers, Louis Silva, followed by Ron Dow, followed by Isaac Asbury. Good morning. Um, I wasn't supposed to talk about this one, but I'm going to say what I have to say. I asked previous sheriffs, uh, McDonald to be exact, on um, problems that were going on in East LA five, six years ago, and he would shine me down. He would pass me to his, whoever was next in command, they would blow me off. Um, so I supported Alex. I heard Alex come up and heard his plan, what he was gonna do about East LA and solving the problems there. And in one year, what he's done, you gotta remember, there was 12 years of previous sheriffs there that did a very lousy job and overlooked a lot of things where didn't want to serve a lot of things. And I've seen Alex already taking care of guys, moving them out, shipping them out, uh, getting rid of people. And Sorry, you know, this, I, this, this, um, we're, we're speaking on, on the website. Yeah, I know, but I was supposed to talk about something else and I asked the lady here about my thing going on and she says, hey, talk anyway. Well, it's at the, at the end is why that's we have hard. this, this public hard. comment. You but I'm just fortunate to know that Alex is doing a very good job. I've seen what he's done for East LA, the morale for the Sheriff's okay. Department, that you haven't had from anybody else in the longest time. That's all I have to say. Thank you. You're welcome to come back for the public comment. Good 
commissioners all repeat, what gets ventured gets done. I listened to subpoena power and I looked at the website the, uh, where everything supposedly is online and I failed to see how any of this will lead to any improvements in public service from the Sheriff's Department. If the goal is really transparency and accountability, there might be another way to, to achieve that goal. I'd like to see you move to, more toward addressing the issues that the community is asking for. And I don't see how that's happening in this environment, nor have I heard where it's happening in any of the previous presentations. What's gets, what gets mentioned, but what gets done? And what may need to happen is you may need to, de to develop clear-cut, measurable goals and objectives for the sheriff to follow. That could be on the website. That could be a part of your regular strategic priorities. And if you want an example for what I'm talking about, go to my website, CompassForCops.org. I did a thesis project in, for Cal State LA several years ago where I identified specific performance measures for the Compton Sheriff Department. And they, they were designed to go through exactly and directly to what the public wants. Now, Compton has been a really weak city, a really, really weakly led city, and they haven't fully picked up on what's been out there before them for years because they are afraid. But their fear does not get us to where we need to be in terms of service delivery for the sheriff department. If you want to get to this interdepartmental inter relationship with other departments, that again is something that can be identified and clearly measured. If your goal is to form a team of people to go out and address homelessness with the sheriff's department, that can be identified up front and measured as we go along. That's the kind of thing that should be on the sheriff's department website. That should be a part of your meeting. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Jacqueline Benford, followed by Carolina Goodman. Good morning again. Uh, last month, I came to the meeting and I provided the uh, sheriff a person, a list of all uh, officer involved shootings that the names we needed. And he was saying he wanted to work with the sheriff's oversight commission and uh, he really wanted to work with you guys. And I gave him a list of the 25 people that were killed for 2019. But then I noticed in the paper, they said that they weren't gonna show up and be here. So I came here to actually see if the sheriff department is not going to show up on this panel. We had a, a crime summit in the city of Compton a week ago. We had over 200 people here. And the sheriff showed up and all they wanted to talk about was gangs. Nobody wants to hear about gangs. They want to hear about officer involved shooting. I have more on my personal website than what I just saw today. Okay, that's all I just said. Then I have another listing that he can take. All we're requesting for, we don't want to know about what happened in the investigation. We just want to know the name of the officer. You got one officer and killed seven people. Seven people. His name it never came up the whole year I've been coming to this uh, commission. It's not your fault, but I can click on my own personal computer and bring up 1,000 officers names who have been involved in officers involved shooting. So for him to come up here and not show up, right, I came down here to see if he was actually not going to show up. Thank you. Carolina Goodman, followed by Michelle Infante. That's okay, Ms. Gaffrey. I uh, was looking at the website, and I've seen a lot of things up there that's not true. If you wanna put post things on your page, you need to make sure it's true. First of all, I have a problem with the uh, sheriff department investigating their own. Mm -hmm. How can you do that? Me, as a citizen, I probably wouldn't find my uh, coworker or nothing guilty because we have established a relationship. And it's not there. I think that's something that uh, needs to be looked into. How do they investigate their own? And I'm saying it from a personal experience. Again, back to the shooting. 
this homicide unit that came in and interviewed my son, told him you shouldn't have did it. They denied him a lie detector test. Everything was all bad. But then this is the same homicide unit that did the investigation that came back in a week and said that they didn't find anything wrong. Annie Gilbertson again from KPCC did a year and a half investigation and found so many things wrong. Some of these things um, I'm asking and I'm begging and praying that you know we can, we got to do better for our uh, our people. You know I'm here as a parent, as a community uh, advocate and as a member of the uh, National Association for Blacks and Criminal Justice. And I learned a lot through this journey. I sit in that courtroom every day and see the just in the law system, in the courts, and so many things that's wrong. And it's not pleasing. It's not pleasing to my eyes, and I know it's not pleasing to God's eyes. We gotta do better. I'm a Christian. And first, I'm standing here because I believe that um, something is gonna happen. I think that we're gonna do better and we gotta to come together for each other because it's not just me. It could be any one of you guys' relatives up there and y'all wouldn't want this to happen to nobody. It's bad. Thank you. Good morning, Carolina Goodman from the League of Women Voters. At the end of January, uh, Sheriff Villanueva asked to meet with us and one of the things he did share with us was his, trans, his goal for transparency. And we were thrilled to hear that. That's one of the things that we really believes in. Transparency leads to accountability. Um, at that time, he said that everything he has is on the website, and one of our league members handed him the use of force policy that she downloaded that morning. And he said, oh no, that's not the right one we have an updated policy, which I will send to you. So it's been a month now, he didn't send it, and I, I apologize for not looking this morning, but is there a way for us to, to see how we would access the new use of force policy that is in compliance with AB 392? Can someone show that to me, or, or at least tell me how I might access it? Thank you. Good morning, commissioners. Um, I have a question, and maybe I can direct it, I don't know, to Mr. Huntsman. Um, forgive me if I'm a little confused, but my question is this. I work with families who are directly and indirectly impacted by uh, not just incarceration trauma, but um, families who uh, have lost loved ones in custody and out of custody. And my question is to LASD and the website that's up here, families have a security hold on their, um, on their cases and families have absolutely no explanation as to why those security holds. I've gone to the LA County coroner and the coroner says that it's not up to them, it's up to LASD, and LASD doesn't have anything, and I haven't seen anything on a website or spoken to anybody who knows what those security holes are, so. My question is, why isn't it up here, and why are, can they take it to, um, because they're working on this website, if they could take it and have an explanation as to what those security holes are, why they have them, who puts them on hold, because I'll give you a quick, ex uh, a quick, um, Helen Jones' uh, son, I know a lot of you know about Helen, Helen Jones, John Horton. Uh, he's had a security hold on his case for at least 10 years. And Helen and I have worked very hard to try to find out the reason why there's security hold and we don't have any explanation at all. So um, I would hope that in the future with them working on this, that one of the, the questions would be, what is the security hold? What is the definition of that hold? And an explanation to the families we have cases that have gone on for years and years. And I have plenty more cases um, after doing some research with the LA County Coroner and autopsy reports. There's a lot of cases that are on security <coughs> and there's absolutely no reason. Thank you. 